doesn't look like much. A boring, almost uninspired shape. No bells, whistles, rattles, props, clackers, or blades. A simple design that looks as though someone was given a broken broom handle and told you have 30 minutes to carve a fishing lure. Now go. But put this particular lure in the water, tied to a bait caster in the hands of a skilled angler, and everything changes. The lure comes alive. It bobs, it weaves, it dances. You realize you have mistaken simplicity for precision. It doesn't need bells or whistles because it is the bells and whistles. Today on Retro Bass, and we're going to look at the history of perhaps the most iconic topwater ever designed, the Hedden Zara Spook. The history of any modern fishing lure, but in particular a head lure like the Zara Spook, must start with the father of the wooden fishing lure, James Hedden. Inducted into the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame in 2020, James Hedden is credited with inventing the wooden-bodied artificial lure. Although he's been dead for over a hundred years, Hedden aficionados know well that fateful trip to Mill Pond in Dwijak, Michigan. In what is now called James Hedden Park, a sign commemorates that fateful day and James Hedden's invention. It was in this spot in the late 1890s that James Hedden sat whittling while waiting for a friend. When he got up to leave, he tossed a small piece of wood into the water where it was immediately struck by a bass. That seemingly insignificant event led James to imagine and then soon developed a unique topwater lure he called the Duwajak. By the late 1920s, James Head and Sons was the largest producer of quality fishing tackle. In his first ever tackle catalog, James Hedden made a pretty profound observation about what makes topwater lures such as his so effective at drawing strikes from game fish. In angling for bass, for which the Duwajak is especially designed, or any other surface feeding game, nothing is gained by making the bait to resemble any living thing. The black bass is primarily a fighter, secondarily a feeder. Therefore, a lure which excites his belligerency rather than his appetite is better calculated to place in the creel. Now take a stroll down your local bass pro shops and gaze upon the rows and rows of prey pattern products and you realize just how advanced this line of thinking was even today. And you also have to wonder what artificial lures would look like today if lure designers spent more time trying to make a bass angry than make him hungry. Well, if you're anything like me, you always wondered what the words Zara and Spook mean. There is a fantastic story which I will link below in the Dallas Morning News that tells the tale of just exactly how the Zara Spook got its name. In Pensacola, Florida in the late 1900s, a man named Angelo Capaduca carved a wooden topwater minnow that proved extremely effective at catching speckled trout. At the time, the seaport of Pensacola had a thriving red light district on, you guessed it, Zaragoza Street. And after one angler saw the lure in action, he reportedly commented that Capaduca's wooden minnow did the hoochie coochie just like the girls on Zaragoza Street. And just like that, the Zaragoza Minnow was born. Thanks to a, a local Hedden dealer, the Zaragoza Minnow ended up in the hands of James Hedden. And in 1921, the wooden number 6500 Zaragoza began to be produced and sold under the Hedden banner. What I find so interesting about Hedden acquiring the Zaragoza Minnow is that at the time, Hedden actually had a number of very popular surface baits including a surface walker by the name of this, the Hedden Slope Nose. This is a remake of the Hedden Slope Nose that Pradco did a few years ago, and minus the metal lip, which again is more of a walking lip than a diving lip, boy, this really does sort of resemble a very rudimentary form of the Zara Spook. In 1939, Hedden released a semi-transparent plastic version of the lure, and the term spook was added to help describe its ghostly appearance. 
According to one ad, the bait had a newly discovered irresistible luring quality and true fish flesh appeal. Although the new spooks were promoted as being transparent and indestructible, Hedden was still perfecting its plastics process and most of those initial spook baits did not outlast their wooden counterparts. I found a great article in the Bass Fishing Archives entitled, What is a Spook? And it brings up a very interesting point. While the term spook was only used to describe the plastic versus wood aspect of the lure, it has since come to mean any cigar-shaped walking style bait, such as the Zara Spook. Well, I am both surprised and not surprised about the origins of the Zara Spook design and name. Well, for one thing, I always assumed that the Zara Spook started out as a freshwater lure, mainly targeting bass, but then was later adopted by saltwater anglers targeting redfish and trout. Walk in any local tackle shop in a saltwater fishing region, and you will literally see dozens of different variety spooks hanging on the wall. But the opposite is actually true. The Zara Spook started out as a saltwater lure and was later adopted by freshwater bass anglers. As I travel the country filming for this channel, I am always amazed at how many baits that are designed for either one region or one species of fish actually can be applied to other regions and other species of fish. And I think the story of the Zara Spook is a great reminder that we should never stop experimenting outside what a lure was originally designed to do. As far as the allure being named after a house of ill repute, I would say it's only surprising if you've never seen a Zara spook dance seductively, swaying from side to side. Live action, as they used to say. Well, before we get into the next section of this video, I do want to pause real quick to let you guys know about a new little website that we recently launched called RetroBassinTackle.com. I've had a number of requests recently for different Retro Bassin merch, including hats, shirts, and decals. And if you head on over to RetroBassinTackle.com, you will see a new section with some pretty cool OG Retro Bassin logo lures, some both from MEPS and also Epping or Daredevil. Let me know if there's anything specific you're looking for because I basically box up every one of those orders myself. Learning to walk the dog as a new bass angler is a lot like learning the F chord as a new guitarist. It's sort of a rite of passage. I remember standing on my dock in Maryland for weeks trying to string together the right sequence of twitch, pause, twitch, to make this bait walk. And even if I did get her walking, she would invariably trip after a few steps. In its most basic form, here is the technique that I have landed on. Hold the rod downward at a 45 degree angle. Impart a downward twitch, moving the rod tip about four to six inches, really not that far. And after that twitch, you immediately want to return the rod tip back to its starting position. Pause for a microsecond, Reel the handle one turn, and then repeat. I often hear folks describe the rhythm necessary to properly walk the dog, and while that is certainly a part of it, I also think it takes a pretty big degree of finesse. If you think about it, it's a technique that is best originated from the fingertips and not the elbows. Perhaps no single angler is more synonymous with the Zara Spook or topwater fishing in general than the late Missouri bass fishing pro, Charlie Campbell. Starting in the 1970s, Campbell put up epic catches with the Spook, including a 55.15 pound stringer to win the Bass Chapter Championship on Table Rock Lake on May 22nd to 24th, 1974. 2011, Neil Keedy wrote a great profile piece on Charlie Campbell and the Zara Spook for the In Fisherman magazine. And my biggest takeaway from this article was how intimately Charlie knew Zara Spooks. And I like to think he could probably pick out subtle variations from model to model or even lure to lure, much like a brook trout inspecting a size 18 parachute Adams. Even though Charlie developed different models of Zara Spook for Hedden, 
including the five and a half inch Super Spook and the three and a half inch Super Spook Junior. His choice of Spook remained old school. A five and a half inch 1950s, 60s thin walled Zara Spook with a line tie at the point of the nose in a bullfrog color pattern. I recently watched a fantastic episode of Intuitive Angling with Randy Blockett entitled A Secret Charlie Campbell Told Me About the Zara Spook. Years ago, Randy asked Charlie if he would give him a master course on fishing the spook. And Charlie shared two very interesting Zara spook techniques that I personally have never heard of, much less tried. The first technique was walking a spook around cover. When most people fish a Zara spook, each switch of the rod is identical, so that as the lure walks from left to right, left to right, each forward movement of the lure is roughly the same. For this reason, the Zara spook, even though it walks left to right, will progress forward in a straight line. But to walk the spook around a piece of shallow cover, Campbell came up with a pretty brilliant technique. Now his first twitch of the spook, let's say it's a left twitch, would be normal. A normal left twitch which would send that lure a little bit in a leftward direction. Now the following twitch is going to be much more subtle and barely even move that bait to the right. Now when it goes back to the next twitch, boom, another strong left twitch, followed by a subtle one. The result is a spook that walks in one direction and can actually walk around a piece of shallow cover. This is a technique that I have never tried. It might be a little bit out of my skill set, but definitely one I'm going to employ next time I'm throwing this bait around some shallow cover. Now the second technique that Charlie told Randy and one that I will have to try next time I'm fishing a deep clear lake in Texas like Lake Travis is how to pull bass up out of deep water with a Zara spook. Step one is to cast that spook as far as you can. When it hits the water, reel as quickly as you can. I'm not exactly sure how far you would reel it, but enough so that that lure is skipping and bouncing all over the surface. From there, you wanna kill the bait and let it rest nose up until all of the ripples subside. Once they do, in part, just one quick twitch, and any bass that followed that bait up from deep water is gonna crash it. This is a great video I will drop a link to down below in the video description. But overall, I think it is a great story about pushing the limits of both technique and design. Although I can't figure out if it emphasizes the genius of the angler, the lure, or both. Any lure that has been in production for over a hundred years is bound to have a varied and colorful catalog history, and the Zara Spook does not disappoint. I found a great spread dedicated to the Zaragozas of Florida in a 1934 Hedden Lure Catalog. There, there are two models available from 90 years ago. First, a 6600 Darting Zara and the classic 6500 Old Zara. The original model Zara sported two treble hooks, checked in at four and a half inches and three quarters of an ounce, and sold for just one dollar. While the specs of the old Zara are pretty much in line with the Zara spook of today, a quick glance reveals this is clearly a very different bait, with a bulbous head and sharply tapered body. While there are too many nuanced changes in the lure over the years, I thought it would be fun to fast forward 50 years from that 1934 catalog to this, the 1984 Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog to check out the lineup of Zara Spooks. Well, Bass Pro Shops touted these spook as their number one selling topwater lure and even dedicated a full page spread to it. Available for $3.79 each, the spook came in 10 colors, including some discontinued colors like original yellow shore minnow, chrome shad, and one of my favorites, natural bass. The design looks identical to today's model with one exception that some eagle-eyed viewers might have already picked up on. Check out the line tie on both the yellow and blue shore minnow. 
No swaybacks in the lineup, but it is very cool to see a line tie in the nose position on those two different ones. Not sure if those yellow shore and blue shore minnows specifically had that line tie in that position for a reason, or it just happened to be a, a little bit of random variation in the line. Over the past 100 years, Hedden has really pushed the envelope with just what is considered a Zara spook. And here are a few of my favorite oddities. For a brief time, this was considered the most advanced piece of bass fishing technology available. This, of course, is the color selector developed by late Dr. Lauren Hill. This device is designed to predict the optimal lure color in a variety of water conditions, including muddy, stained, and clear water. What you do is you drop this little sensor down in the water, turn on the color selector, and wait till the dial tells you which color lure to use. I've done a few videos on this, and this is probably one of my favorite gimmicks of all time. What is so interesting about the color selector phenomena is how many major lure companies jumped on the bandwagon. And soon everybody was issuing lures that were color selector approved. Well, Hedden was no exception, and they came out with a full line of Zara Spooks, all with color selector approved colors. Here's the only one I have in my collection right now, but this is a pretty fun one. A pretty wild chartreuse with a black back. Probably one of the wildest Zaras I've ever thrown. Well, the next Zara spook I want to talk about is this one. The short-lived drop Zara spook. According to an ad in Bass Pro Shop, this was uh, sort of modified from a technique that pros had been using for years. I'm not sure what pros those are, but this seems like a pretty complicated way to fish a spook. This spook, while the front hook is in the normal position, notice it's missing a rear hook. And here's what's going on with this bait. It actually has a through line from the chin of the bait all the way to the tail. And what you're supposed to do is run your line through the bait and then tie it to this treble hook here which has a little bit of a uh, sinker ahead of it. I think this bait is supposed to, in theory, walk the same way, but when you pause it in the water, that weight will cause that bucktail and hook to sink down, perhaps to attract some bass that are investigating the spook, but have not fully committed. I have never actually fished a drop zero spook. I have two of them in the package. This one I opened up just for this video, and now that I've got it open, it might be time to see if this drop action would actually work. Next in the Zara line is a bait that is, well, Zara only in name. This is a discontinued lure from Hedden, actually named the Zara Gosa. I'm not sure why Hedden ended up resurrecting the name of the original Zara Spook, but either way they did, except they did it in the bait that has absolutely almost nothing to do with the Zara Spook. This bait, uh, discontinued is a subsurface bait meant to be sort of a hard version of a soft plastic jerk bait like a sluggo. I have fished this a couple times and truth be told it's not one of my favorite baits to fish only because in most scenarios where I'm throwing a sluggo I would prefer a weedless approach and as you can tell the Zaragoza has two hooks that are well not the best at avoiding weeds. Well, Hedden really went the other direction with this next Zara Spook oddity, the soft classic version of the Zara Spook Puppy. I have fished this bait before. I've never actually done an episode on it. I think I did an episode on the Rebel Popar version, but this is basically a soft plastic version of the Zara Spook meant to be rigged with a single worm hook. Unlike the Zaragoza, which does nothing but catch weeds, this one is actually a pretty weedless bait, but walks on the surface like a Zara Spook instead of fish underneath the surface like a worm. These things were probably a little bit more popular than the Zaragoza, but again, for whatever reason, they were discontinued from the Hedden and Rebel lines. Though, of course, old Retro's got a few, so let me know if I should throw this one day. Considering this bait has been in production for over a hundred years, there is simply no way to cover the entirety of the Zara Spook Cannon 
in a short YouTube video such as this. Fortunately, there is a large swath of information available on the internet, and I will put links down below to every resource that I use to make this video. That Dallas Morning News article on the origins of the Zara Spook is definitely worth a read, as is the In Fisherman profile piece on Charlie Campbell. Of course, the Bass Fishing Archives is always a great resource for bass fishing history. And let's not forget that Randy Blockett, amazing video on Charlie Campbell and two of his best Zara Spook secrets. So back to the question that I posed in the title to this video. Is the Head and Zara Spook the greatest topwater lure of all time? Well, when it comes to old school topwaters, I like them all. The Rebel Popar, the Smithwick Devil's Horse, the Arbogast Jitterbug, and the Head and Torpedo, to name just a few. But you would be hard pressed to find a lure that has been so effective for so many fish for so long as the Head and Zara Spook. And it would be hard not to call it the greatest topwater of all time. But by all means, I'm sure there are some varied opinions on this. So if you think that I'm wrong in this assertion, definitely drop a comment down below and let me know what you think is the greatest topwater lure ever invented. Also, let me know if you guys are enjoying this History of series and let me know what other classic old school baits you would like to see featured on the channel. And if you're looking for some more old school content, you can click right here. Otherwise, I'll see you right back here, same time, same place-ish. And until then, keep that carpet side up, keep that dog walking, and definitely fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin.